All right, it is noon. Welcome back, everybody. Um, welcome to the third session in the. Uh, I just, sorry, I probably just heard some calendar noise from me. Uh, welcome to the third session in the series on root rots. Today we are going to be talking about uh, forest management strategies strategies for, for root diseases. And we have Dan Omdahl with us from the Washington Department of Natural Resources. Hey, Dan. Hey. Um, before we go ahead and jump into it, just the usual logistics. Um, some people yesterday still didn't have their chat box setting set to everyone. Please make sure that you do that. This is just so it gets recorded in the chat transcript for some folks that want to view this later. Um, the chat can be very valuable and being able to see the questions that you ask is important. So make sure you do that. It's just a little drop down box when you're in the chat menu. Um, and all of these sessions are recorded. Uh, day one and day two are already up here on my website. So feel free to go back and look at those and I'll be uploading today's this afternoon. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to you, Dan, and uh, take it away. Great. Thanks, Patrick. I assume you see my first slide up there on the screen. Is that right? I do. Yes. Yeah. So um, here we are on day three. Thanks for sticking around. Um, my name is Dan. I work with Rachel here in Olympia uh, as another forest pathologist with the uh, Washington Department of Natural Resources. And by now, you're probably familiar with our agenda. A uh, couple of days looking at uh, introduction to root rots and species ID. And uh, um, today we're going to talk about management options. And uh, anyone who's had any experience working with root diseases is uh, sort of the conventional wisdom. It's, it's arguably um, one of the most difficult group of forest diseases uh, to manage. Um, as we've seen earlier, sometimes the symptoms uh, for root disease can be rather ambiguous, oftentimes confounded by drought and bark beetles. Um, trying to find the fungi can be challenging, often requiring lots of digging. Um, um, uh, sometimes trying to figure out, you know, the distribution or the extent of the disease in the forest is hard because you frequently have trees that are infected that are not yet showing symptoms. And so that can be hard. And, uh, and really, uh, in many instances, your management options are can be can be rather limited, but but root diseases are a big problem and um, and it's really hard to ignore them. And there's a couple of reasons why it's hard to ignore them. And one is that they're they're rather ubiquitous throughout our forests in the Pacific Northwest. And here we have a, a map just showing the distribution of laminated root rot in Western North America. And basically, wherever there are trees, um, laminated root rot is present. Certainly, where their hosts are present. And uh, although I don't have a map of our malaria distribution, uh, it would be even more expansive than you see here with laminated root rot and similarly with heterobacidian. So these uh, pathogens are ubiquitous in our forests, both on the east and the west side of the Cascades. And they're also hard to ignore because, man, they're, they're tree killers and um, losses from uh, root diseases, uh, all root diseases uh, across this 15 year period uh, are projected to exceed over a billion square feet uh, of wood. And so they're, 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 they're problematic. Um, so um, we do, we do what we can. Um, we try to contain them and we manage them as best as we can. And so a uh, couple of steps that I usually go through uh, in helping me figuring out uh, what to do and a couple of options that uh, I'll provide for you guys. And by now, uh, the first step is to figure out, you know, who, who's doing the killing, like who's responsible for the mortality. Um, we've seen symptoms and just symptoms alone can probably draw you into root diseases, but uh, in order to get a definitive diagnosis, you really you really need to see um, uh, the signs and become familiar with them. And so on the left here, we have um, uh, a tree. Uh, we've removed the bark. We see this white, maybe a cream, sometimes yellow colored uh, mycelial fan. Sometimes, usually not until late in the season after the fall rains start, you may see some 
uh, honey colored mushrooms that are gilled as opposed to poured um, like a boli. These are gilled mushrooms. And then you might find some in the lower left, the schusting like appendages. Um, and you would recognize this by now as um, uh, armillaria root disease. In that center column, um, imagine putting your hand into a well decayed stump and you pull out this clump of delaminated wood. You look really close at it and you uh, observe that on either side of these sheets, these delaminations, uh, you'll see tiny little pits uh, on both sides uh, of the laminae. If you look really closely with a hand lens, you might recognize the cetal hyphae. And if you're lucky uh, in the bottom center, you might stumble across these chocolate colored resupinate fruiting bodies. And by now you, you should recognize that as uh, laminated root disease. And finally, off to the right there, similarly delaminated wood. Uh, if you look really closely, however, you'll notice that uh, one side of the laminae are actually rather smooth and the pits uh, in this instant only occur on one side. Uh, these white cellulose pockets with little black flecks uh, might be present and uh, really uh, for heterobacidian, it's oftentimes trying to find these perennial woody conchs um, underside with small uh, regular pores. And at the perimeter of these conchs, you have this uh, sterile margin, an area around the edge here that doesn't have pores. And by now you recognize that or should as uh, heterobacidian root disease. So the next step is um, we know we have these diseases and trying to figure out how extensive they are um, in our stand. Are they even worth paying attention to? And so here's a couple of pictures that you're likely to see throughout the life of uh, a forest um, at time zero. Uh, obviously that's, that's uh, soon after harvest. Uh, you come up uh, across a unit you might see lots of slash lying around. And in order to do a survey for root disease, it's, it takes a lot of energy. There are a lot of transects required because the only way uh, to determine the presence of root disease is to look for these stumps. And some of them are really obvious, like the one in the upper left here, uh, hollow in this instance. Uh, some of the more subtle indications are this one stump 548, and you see the staining around the sapwood, a uh, little darker in color than the rest of the xylem in the cross section here. And this is apparent in infected trees uh, soon after they're cut, but this staining doesn't last very long. Um, and just as, as, an, as an aside, uh, we refer to that as incipient decay, this, this discoloration around the perimeter of the sapwood. And so that's an indication that the fungus is obviously present on the root of this tree. It's excreting its enzymes, but there hasn't been enough time for the decay uh, to set in. So this wood is actually uh, pretty hard, pretty solid. Um, but if you do see it, it's, it's advised that you record that, uh, either putting cross cuts with a chainsaw, painting the stump, putting a flag there, some indication to let you know that that's an area that is likely infested with, um, with a root rot. A couple of pictures in the center here, as these trees age, single trees will turn yellow and red and die. You can see at time 13, probably up to 20, when you lose a single tree, they're, they're easily uh, hidden by the neighbors. And so once again, a lot of transects are required uh, to navigate through these stands in order to get an assessment of how expansive the disease is on your property. This picture in the lower right at time 30 is an indication of um, the disease um, symptoms that you're likely to see uh, late in the age of a stand. And you can see, you can uh, just drive along the roads or walk along the trails and see uh, oftentimes far into the woods and get a good sense of the extent of the root disease. But regardless of when in the life of the stand that you do your savior surveys, it's important to realize that uh, any survey in general tends to underestimate the total amount of root disease on your property. 
And that's indicated by this graph in the upper right. And this is some data that was provided to me by some of my industry colleagues. And so they would survey different stands um, at different ages and try to get a sense of the area of those units that were infected by root disease. And if they only looked at the mortality, if the mortality was the only indicator that they looked at, they significantly underestimated the total amount of root disease on the site, which was only later determined by a very extensive and, and exhaustive uh, digging and excavating stumps and, and whatnot. So even when they included uh, symptomatic trees, uh, those that were visible, um, still uh, a significant underestimation of the total area infected because of the prevalence oftentimes of asymptomatic trees, trees uh, like we saw with the incipient decay, the fungus is on the tree, but it hasn't developed yet to a point where you're actually, it's affecting the tree uh, to any significant degree. So, uh, so what do we know about these root disease pathogens? Well, we know that the fungi that cause them can persist in stumps for as Rachel alluded to yesterday for decades and decades. And so this picture on the left, this sort of silver sun-baked case hardened old stump uh, was cut or died uh, at least a decade ago. And the tree to the left of that, that's a young Douglas fir tree that was about eight years old and uh, it's dead. And so what happened was this young seedling was planted immediately adjacent to this old stump that although it looked rather innocuous, uh, was still harboring the pathogen. And uh, as the roots of the young seedling came in contact underground with the infected stumps, the fungus was able to jump onto that young sapling and, and, and kill it. So um, oftentimes the greatest mistakes are made when you plant, regenerate sites with uh, species um, upon which uh, the previous uh, stand was occupied. And so, um, and then oftentimes uh, the, the disease on these sites just is compounded uh, as uh, you provide the fungus with more nutrition and allow it to persist on those sites even longer than they would otherwise. And so a really useful publication for looking at laminated root rot is this um, publication in the middle by uh, Tees and Sturick. And the first um, table in that book, table one, lists the susceptibility of different species to laminated root rot. And um, in this particular case, it starts out with a highly susceptible, uh, tolerant down below the middle of the page and resistant. So um, uh, just be aware that not all conifers are equally susceptible to the three different pathogens that we've, we've talked about so far. And here's just a couple of other references that are available to you. Uh, I included them, um, uh, one, to introduce them to you, but two, just to show uh, this table on the right here came out of the book uh, out of Oregon State University. And what they do here is they've translated the terms resistant and susceptible and tolerant into heavily damaged, severely damaged, and not damaged. So just to be aware that um, um, people characterize them uh, in different ways, but the message is the same. And so here's three sites that were at one time and may still be infested with uh, Kinephoporia sulfuracens, which is the pathogen that causes laminated root rot. And in the upper left, uh, it was planted with a Western white pine. And in most of the publications, Western white pine is considered tolerant to laminated root disease. So the expectation is that here, uh, these trees are infrequently infected and rarely killed. Uh, in the center, we have uh, another pocket that was uh, cut out and planted with Western red cedar, once again, recognized as a resistant species. So our expectation here is that uh, these trees are rarely infected and almost never killed. And finally, in the lower right, we have um, uh, a red alder, which as you recall from a couple of slides back is uh, sits under the, as a hardwood, uh, immune to this particular disease. So we don't ever expect it to get an infected or, or killed from this particular disease. So here's three examples of uh, all, you know, 
reasonable choices for planting in a soil that's infested with, with laminated root disease. Thinning, um, thinning's a bit of a mixed bag and, um, uh, and we'll talk about that. So what do we know uh, about these fungi? And the image on the right is, is one of the things we appreciate about them is that they move, they can move through spores and they can move through other means, but in the forest, they primarily move along the roots of infected trees. And so um, that, that matters when it comes to thinning. And so thinning when the trees are young, when the roots are small, right? It, 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 um, it minimizes the root contact between adjacent trees and the subsequent spread of the disease. And the other advantages are, are rather intuitive for anyone who's managed a forest. Uh, as you reduce the density, you uh, improve the vigor of those trees that are remaining and they in turn are more resistant um, through their vigor, uh, um, more able to defend themselves against these pathogens. Um, we're able to eliminate the sick, the lame, and the lazy trees from the population. And so we're left with um, the tolerant species. And so thinning while uh, the trees are relatively young, pre-commercial can be quite uh, advantageous for a stand that might in fact uh, have some level of root disease um, present. Um, but here's the issue with thinning is that living trees, um, as we know, they, they have defense mechanisms that allow them, even once they're infected, to, to keep these pathogens at bay. Um, but once these trees are cut or once they die, they're no longer able to do that. And these fungi then run rampant throughout uh, a, an infected tree's root system. And so we saw this picture on the left. Um, and so then these stumps become sources of inoculum, um, able to transfer fungi from one tree to the next. We talked about this picture on the left. The one on the right is of a Ponderosa pine tree that was killed by armillaria root disease. You see this huge lateral that's coming out towards you in the picture. Uh, it's entirely possible that when the tree died, there was no fungus on that particular root. Um, but certainly once that tree died, the entire uh, root system became colonized by the pathogen. And that matters because you see all these uh, smaller roots sort of crisscrossing this large lateral root. And if you look really closely on the right-hand side of the picture, you see a lot of little saplings, little seedlings with yellow ribbon on them. They all have roots uh, attached to them that actually cross this lateral root and uh, were killed by the same fungus that killed this uh, large, large uh, pine tree there. So um, stumps can also be sources of inoculum when uh, the spores from heterobacinian are able to germinate on these freshly cut stumps. And um, uh, we've seen this life cycle earlier, how the spores come out of these conchs, they land on these suitable substrates, the spores germinate, move into the stumps, and, um, and then get established in the root system. So uh, here's um, one of the ways that you can mitigate uh, the effect of this heterobacidian is uh, by applying um, um, a boron-based compound to these freshly cut stumps. And here's, here's, a, here's a project that I did. It was probably about 25 years ago now. We commercially thinned a, um, a Western hemlock, kind of mixed conifer, did have some fur in there some true fur in there uh, out along the Ho River. And soon after we cut the trees, I came along afterwards and you can see the bottle off to the right here, my little boron. I think I used a borax or timbor, one of those two products that contain boron and you sprinkle it like a salt shaker on these cut stumps. And you can see um, them sort of scattered about. And the idea is that, um, you know, I, I didn't appreciate how much anose, uh, heterobacidin was in that stand. And the idea was that we, we didn't want any more. And so, uh, so we did that. But um, 
while there are many areas that this kind of treatment can actually uh, be beneficial, and I'm thinking of like a Ponderosa Pine Stand in uh, Eastern Washington, where heterobacidian hasn't quite taken hold in that forest, um, as an example of a stand that might benefit uh, from this kind of treatment. I, this stand here out on the hoe was, was not one of those stands for a couple of reasons. Uh, and I think you can see down here by my shaker, uh, there is a lot of scarring. So there's, and then there's this tree in the center here. Um, there's a lot of scarring going on. So there's a lot of vertical surfaces that I couldn't get the spore axe to adhere to. So that was a problem. The other thing is I didn't really appreciate the extent to which the the unit was already infested with heterobacidian. And here's a hemlock tree on the left. And you can see down my Pulaski, by the Pulaski, here's a, here's a conch here. And then this is a silver fir. And there's a bunch of little conchs down here. I, 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 I missed that uh, all those years ago. And so this was a stand that already had uh, just an abundance of uh, heterobacidian in the stand. And the other thing I didn't appreciate back then um, you know, it's only since that time that we've um, we've separated heterobacidian anosum into heterobacidian occidentale and heterobacidian irregulari, two different species. Uh, what I didn't appreciate back then was um, the pattern of decay uh, by this heterobacidian occidentale, which in our coastal forests, as you can see here, acts much more like a butt rotter. And so as long as it's contained in the heartwood, as you can see in both of these instances, uh, these trees can grow for a long time in the absence of any sort of uh, above ground crown symptoms. Um, so uh, um, for those reasons, it's probably not recommended uh, 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 to use um, these boron compounds uh, on uh, heterobacidian infected sites. In fact, the strategy these days is just to uh, shorten the length of rotation so that you can uh, harvest these trees long before um, this um, butt rot really takes hold of these trees. Uh, one thing we are likely to see um, in thin stands is uh, a prevalence of wind throw. Um, and, and once again, uh, I sound like a broken record, but it's often because the trees we leave behind, they look good, but they are often, in fact, infected by root disease. And any impact on the roots uh, compromise a tree's ability to hold up in strong winds. And so down they go. Um, but interestingly enough, maybe ironically even, is that that seems to be uh, nature's way of sort of reclaiming these infested sites. You can see what happens as the wind blows these trees down, the roots pop out of the ground, and it, it's not long after these uh, roots and stumps are exposed to the elements that the, that the fungus that's causing them can, uh, can die. And so sort of a, an advanced type of wind throw, a little more sophisticated, is the use of these um, wide tracked excavators to uh, do stumping for you, right? And um, so this, interestingly, you know, this, this, this process used to be in vogue in maybe the 70s and 80s, um, but it's, it doesn't happen much here in Washington these days that I'm aware of. But what surprises me is the prevalence of stumping um, in our neighbors to the north. Um, our BC Ministry of Forest um, last that I checked, they're into stumping for root disease to the tune of about 5,000 acres every year. In fact, uh, there's a publication here uh, in Forest Ecology and Management by uh, Bogdansky, and he's an economist. And um, based on a few assumptions about uh, favorable field conditions, uh, those being shallow soils, the shallow slopes and deep soils, um, and under favorable economic and growth conditions, he sees um, a positive benefit to cost ratio for stumping. The, the benefits that you get from uh, growth and yield um, exceed the costs of this treatment. Um, 
just checking the time here. Okay, so many of you have uh, seen this slide yesterday. Rachel showed it up. I, I was really intrigued by it, that uh, so much so that I, I requested it from her uh, presentation, and she was gracious enough to share it with me. But uh, the point that you see here is that um, there's a lot of variability in the, 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 the way these pathogens are distributed uh, throughout the forest. Um, but in those unique situations, or maybe not so unique situations, where uh, root disease does occur in very distinct and discrete pockets, uh, the options here, especially in the case of laminated root disease, might be to actually delineate that pocket, cut all those trees, and then um, cut a buffer around those trees. Uh, this buffer consists of trees that are not infected with the root disease. Now remember, um, these root, uh, the, in the case of laminated root disease specifically, the fungus does not leave the infected root in search of a susceptible host, as in the case of our malaria. Um, to the contrary, it's those growing roots in the case of laminated root disease that run in to the infected stumps. So in the case of these uh, distinct and discrete pockets of laminated root rot, you can delineate these pockets and uh, cut them out and create a little buffer. And so this picture on the right is an area that uh, uh, exactly that was happened. You can see uh, the tubing protecting the Western red cedar. We remember that as a resistant species. And uh, off to the right here, I'm, I'm sort of in the donut taking this picture. And so off to the right in the foreground, uh, the decision was made actually to leave these trees in the pocket, in, 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 the, in the hole of the donut, so to speak. And the intent there was um, to have those trees blow over. And the hope was that as and when they blew over, their root wads would come out of the ground, expose the roots to the sun, and the pathogen would die away. And you can see um, in the in the foreground that there's one tree has that's already happened. So this one tree is lying on the ground, and the hope is that over time, um, exposing this clump will um, blow them all over, uh, and in a sense to accelerate the 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 decline of the pathogen in the soil. A couple other strategies that are frequently discussed when talking about root disease management. Uh, in the lower left, we have fertilization. Uh, of course, the idea with fertilization is that um, we're going to improve the vigor of these trees through nutrient enhancement and, and thereby increasing their ability to fend off uh, pathogens. What we've discovered is that many of these nitrogen-based fertilizers, their effect on the tree is to increase the sugar concentrations in the roots, which then make them actually rather uh, preferable to these pathogenic fungi. So you can fertilize for not, lots of reasons. Um, to control root disease is, is probably not one of them. Uh, prescribed fire, or even a wildfire that you see here, um, uh, soil can be a really effective insulator against the heat that's generated by fire. And so at best, uh, fires might eliminate uh, fire dependent, fire, fire, fire sensitive hosts. Um, but uh, their effect on uh, roots um, is, is actually quite negligible. Sometimes stumps might be consumed, but um, most of the fungi um, survive um, um, even even moderate intensity fires. Uh, in the bottom right, chemicals have been used um, you can get rid of uh, pathogens on single stumps, um, but it's hard to um, uh, make it cost effective on a large scale. In the upper right here, uh, using other antagonistic fungi, they're, they're trichodermas, they're uh, um, hyphalomas, they're plebeopsis, there's several fungi that are antagonistic to our pathogens, but they're, as far as I'm aware, um, there's uh, no uh, agents yet registered for use in the United States uh, to control these, these three pathogens that we have here. <clears throat> 
And um, you know, if you're looking, if you're looking to increase um, um, big game forage or small animal animal habitat, um, or trying to add some coarse woody debris to your to your stand. Uh, wildlife biologists certainly appreciate the benefits that uh, these root disease pockets add by enhancing the complexity of these stands. Here's a couple of stands that are, uh, the one on the left is near my house. It's in um, a Douglas fir, pure Douglas fir stand. It's about 60 years old. I've been watching this stand for about 20 years. Every year, about two or three trees die. Um, and there, there's nothing really to uh, impede the advancement. It's it's just solid Douglas fir and uh, solid uh, coniferporia. So it's just going to slowly march through this particular stand. The one on the right is an old growth stand, probably about 250 years old, mixed um, western red cedar, western hemlock, Douglas fir. Uh, the dead tree in the back is the last standing Douglas fir in the pocket. Uh, interestingly enough, although western hemlock is considered a susceptible species in this particular pocket, it looks like the coniferporia was specific to the Douglas fir, and the pocket appears to be rather contained. I don't think it's going to get much bigger in this particular instance, uh, uh, I, I imagine, in the not-too-distant future, just like this tree in the foreground fell over this long uh, um, standing snag is also going to fall over, and with it, uh, likely uh, the roots as well. Um, but regardless, um, one tool that may be helpful as you consider your options is this Western root disease model, which is an extension of the U.S. Forest Service uh, Forest Vegetation Simulator. And um, it's it's really cool if you've never played around with models. It's, it's one that uh, might be interesting to you. Uh, there's lots of tutorials on, on YouTube on how to do it. You can download it from the Forest Service. But it gives you a sense of uh, the effects of growth and yield on various silvicultural prescriptions that you might engage. Um, and I think with that, we're probably at about 12.30. So I'm going to stop showing you slides, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if we have time. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, um, it's only only two minutes over, so you're on, on real good time. Okay. And I really appreciate you putting that slide in there about kind of a, a hands-off, because I think for a lot of forest owners, the objectives of wildlife habitat and diversity are above, you know, timber production or something like that. So it's very common for, uh, you know, the forest owners I work with to just, you know, doing nothing is the best option. Sometimes it just makes sense. It's kind of doing the work for them, creating habitat and diversity. Um, so there was several questions and Rachel did a good job answering many of them. It's hard to kind of keep track of where the question and the answer were. So I think I'm just going to go ahead and read them off. And then Rachel, you feel free to, to chime in as well. I'll, I'll give them to you, Dan, but you guys are both welcome to uh, to chime in. Uh, the, one of the first questions was about uh, root rot issues in state parks in that we had actually a few different people answer this question, some who I believe work with or for the state parks on who manages root rot issues um, in state park lands. And that is a really interesting question because it gets very complex there of whether or not they should be managing it. Because obviously a root rot can, trees with root rot can cause uh, or, or be considered hazard trees, can cause damage to structures and people, but at the same time, a lot of people don't like it when you cut trees down. Um, so I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on that, Dan, but the the answer to the question was basically that uh, they have a small arbor crew and a forester that sort of makes those decisions for them. But it's an interesting added complexity when you're looking at public lands like that. Yeah, I've been working with state parks for probably 25 years now. And initially it was absolutely a hands-off. Um, uh, the objective was a habitat and diversity, um, but there were challenges in the uh, early aughts with hazard trees. There were a couple mm -hmm. of fatalities. Uh, Lake Wenatchee State Park had a fatality that uh, the legislator kind of changed all that, that required them to address the issues with root disease. And um, over at Riverside State Park, um, uh, a lot of work has been done managing those ponderosa pines uh, for uh, to mitigate uh, 
uh, bark beetle mortality. So it's it's sort of evolved over time. Um, so we got a question from Wes here. Uh, would allowing natural regeneration prone to root disease, uh, grand fur, for example, in areas with armillaria and anosis be poor management as well? So what about volunteers that sprout up in those areas? Yeah, that's, you know, I talked about Mother Nature sort of cleansing these sites of these disease by tipping these trees over. <laughs> uh, these volunteers can sort of set set the disease back a bit in the sense that uh, it, it's feeding the, the fungus uh, crumbs, if you will, because it's likely that uh, initially this regeneration passes as, oh, these are survivors, but it's likely just because of, of opportunity. The small trees and their small root systems have yet to come in contact with uh, infected root material, but as soon as they do, um, they're, they're readily infested and, and quickly die. Mm. I had a follow-up question uh, that I hope I'm understanding correctly. Would thinning in stands about 15 inches in diameter with moderate root disease and leaving trees susceptible to root disease be acceptable management uh, and stands managed for timber production? Uh, I'm going to be bold and say probably not if your objective is timber management. A lot of it depends on the, on the uh, extent of disease in your unit. I think the threshold is probably about 20%. If, if as many as 20% of your acres are infected with root disease, it's probably not recommended that you thin in these stands because like I said, you might um, estimate that 20% of those uh, that unit is infested because of mortality and symptoms. But there's a good chance that in fact, a greater percentage of that area is infected, but you're just unable to account for that. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so Sue asked, if you plant different species at an affected site, how long does it take, uh, if any, to reintroduce the trees that are susceptible to the disease? So we kind of had this question a couple of times that, but uh, over the last couple of days, but yeah, like how, how long do people have to wait before they can plant a, a dug fir back in a laminated root rot, or for example? Yeah, it, it depends, right? It depends on the size of the stump. So I can remember earlier in my career, we were doing a lot of alder planting on, on uh, laminated root rot sites. And I can remember going back to a stand uh, that was 30 years old, and it was maybe a little young for uh, an alder hardest, harvest, but it was being considered for an alder hard harvest. And I went in there and I did an assessment. And after 30 years, those stumps were probably in the range of 18 to 20 inches, maybe 22 inches in diameter. And there were still viable uh, um, conifoporia in those larger stumps. And so the, the recommendation was, let's go another round of, of alder. Another 35 year rotation is likely required in that particular instance. So it depends on the size of the stumps. Yeah. And that's uh, basically what Rachel looks like, what Rachel said as well. And I've got another question here. This is one I get all the time. And um, Rachel had a good answer to it. I have a large pine in front of my house. And during the past three, few years, it has a lot of sap coming out along the side of the tree. Is that a disease? I think maybe it has, uh, has a fungus. And Aunt, uh, Rachel's suggested uh, having someone come and look at the tree, especially if it's near your house. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add, Dan, but that's, that's it's very difficult to say. Trees produce uh, sap for a lot of different reasons, not necessarily a fungus. I agree. Yeah. And, and since it is close to a house and considered a, a potential hazard tree, it's really important that you get a, a certified ar arborist, I will say, from the International Society of Arbor Arbor Culture really struggling with my words today. Um, Laurel asks, if I understand correctly, thinning slash killing a tree in a laminated root rot infection zone becomes a super spreader of a root rot while leaving the tree alone might lessen its potency as a spreader? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question exactly, but um, so it, here, here's another way to think about uh, harvesting and root disease centers that uh, any stump that you leave on site uh, really promotes the disease, okay? Now, a tree, on the other hand, 
has the ability to topple over. A stump has lost that ability. So like, like I showed you with the, uh, the patch cut, uh, those trees that were in the center in the hole of that donut were left standing. Uh, so the options there were, well, listen, we can cut those trees down and haul them off to the lumber mill. Uh, but in so doing, we leave the fungus that still resides in the stumps. The other option is to leave those trees standing and the likelihood that they will then blow over is great. And so the benefit of, in a sense, cleansing that hole of stumps that are infested with root, with root disease exceeded the cost of, of not uh, capturing the value at the mill. Right, thanks. Um, so we got an, another question from Jean here. Do you know what causes an individual tree to be resistant? Does it make some sort of chemical defense? And then she has a follow-up question after that. But I think that's, a, that's an interesting question. What, how, how do individual trees defend themselves from root rot? Uh, I don't know. It's really complicated, but I, 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 would, I would flip that question on its head. And this is what I would say. My experience in many forests, that every tree is infected. Every tree has something nibbling on its roots, mm. kind of like everyone who's watching and tuning into this meeting today. We're here a bit able to do that, not because we don't have any pathogens in our system, but because we have the ability through our immune system to keep those pathogens at bay. And so oftentimes what you see in the forest is trees that are in fact infected. In fact, some uh, I've harvested trees that it was estimated that they had infections for over 30 and 40 years. They had been, we, we refer to it as uh, a tree dealing with a wolf chained to its leg that most trees in the forest, many trees in the forest are dealing with a wolf chained to its leg in the tune of a fungus nibbling on its roots. But it's when that tree through competition, through stress, through from drought, uh, all of a sudden loses its ability to defend itself when that imbalance takes place that the pathogen that had been there oftentimes for decades, is now able to overcome the defenses of that tree and kill it. Now, right next to it might be other trees that have that are equally infected, but have space. And now as this one tree died, the resources that were being taken up by the, the dying tree are now liberated uh, for the neighbors and uh, provide a, a sense of um, extension of life for those trees that remain still dealing with infections on their roots. Perfect. And, and she followed up with a question that Rachel answered, and I'm, I'm sure you'll agree with her answer, which is, um, would forests benefit from more diverse mix of plants? Uh, and, and Rachel said, uh, yeah, a diversity of, of plants and, and resistance to those root rots is going to slow those diseases down. Yeah, you know, that's that's the ideal situation, right? I, I think of areas, though, on the on the edges of forest. I think of uh, ponderosa pine in the scrublands, uh, where it's only ponderosa pine. Right. You know, I alluded to sometimes options for managing root diseases can be limited. And in many places in eastern Washington, if you don't have ponderosa pine, you, you, th there are a few other species that are conifer species that are capable of growing in such arid conditions. And so... Um, you know, diversity uh, has its limits. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Something to be grateful for here in Western Washington. So Valerie asked, could you inoculate stumps with oyster mushrooms? The idea of be getting, the idea of being getting uh, a desirable fungi in the stump before other, you know, feral fungi get in. I'd be happy to take a stab at this one too. Could you? Yes. Yes, you could. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Whether or not it would ever displace uh, your pathogen is is a completely other question. Uh, I would say it would be at a competitive disadvantage, right, from the pathogen that's already uh, been established on that stump. So there might be limits in uh, how much of that stump it could, it could decay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think for the most part, oysters are grown in... Uh, in what they call totem systems, where they take stumps that are not 
they're fresh stumps. They're not inoculated with any kind of root disease or, or, or anything. Um, and, and then they inoculate them with the oysters, sort of giving them a head start. Um, but doing it on the stump, I've heard, I've heard is possible like you, but I've never actually seen it done successfully myself. Um, let's see, where are we? Okay, so Wes has another sort of situational question. When 80% of leaf trees are prone to root disease, would that be a wise thinning project? And you've touched on this a bit so far, but it's maybe a little more of a specific scenario. There's a good chance that they will blow down. Mm. Let's see. All right, trying to find the next questions here. Which remember, it may, it may not be problematic because what you can expect from those areas uh, that the tree blew down is that those stumps are going to come out of the ground and certainly in that area, to a degree, cleanse that patch from the pathogen. So we got another question from Wes here. He said, I think you already said it, but the stumps of the areas with root disease are sources of root disease in the next generation. Does the regeneration of the same species of the previous stand increase the root disease mortality in the next generation and each, each succeeding regeneration. So I, I think you have yes. to on this, yeah. Yes. Uh, Gene says, would you plant, would planting birch within a recently planted dug fir stand help reduce armillaria root disease? Uh, if you could get it to grow, uh, likely. There, there, there is, you know, one of the misnomers with armillaria is that they're, you know, 10 or 12 different species of armillaria. The one that I think um, Rachel alluded to uh, yesterday is solidipes or um, um, astoi. Um, and so it's different from the armillaria species that infects the hardwoods, which is probably melia or, mm. or another one. So they, it may be apples and oranges to the fungus. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that as a follow up, because I know our malaria is thought of as just the huge host range. But ultimately, if you have something I, I have from the property that I manage for WSU, I have uh, our malaria that's affecting maples and alders, but it's not affecting any of the dug firs or, or any of the conifers in the near area, which is interesting. So it must be uh, one of those subspecies. And, and, you know, to add a little more uh, confusion to it is even within the species, solidipes or astoi, that there's a lot of clonal variability uh, within the species. And so uh, you might have armillaria stoi, or yeah, we'll just use armillaria stoi synonymous with solidipedes, that uh, um, when I see armillaria, on somebody's property, I'm looking to see what is the specific host that it's favoring. And my, my thinking is that that seems to be on that particular site, its preference. And so it's not surprising to me uh, what you're observing. Yeah. Um, so Charlie asks, when hand planting near these infestations, uh, are there criteria and contracts to avoid planting in the areas with the same species of trees, basically, or have you seen examples of you know harvesting or reforesting contracts that take this into into mind? Um, it, that's not my line of work. I don't really deal with contracts, but um, it, it it makes sense, right? I mean, one of the challenges if you only have say three percent of your unit that's affected by root disease, and yeah. you're concerned about efficiencies, it's probably most efficient just to plant the entire unit with the same species. If on the other hand, you have these discrete pockets that make up 20% of your unit, it might be wise to, to compartmentalize these units uh, separately. Yeah. And it's also wise, you know, we talked about the role that these root contacts make. Oftentimes people plant uh, immediately adjacent to stumps. The idea is that there's this unique microhabitat, maybe protecting them from shade. But um, uh, I would recommend planting as far away from these stumps as you possibly could uh, to avoid for as long as you can uh, any sort of root-to-root -root contact. 
And, they, and I think maybe that's what Charlie was referring to, too. And I would say, Charlie, that working with a consulting forester to put together that contract and mark up those areas is well worth it in a situation like that. Um, and generally, we recommend working with a consulting forester anytime you're harvesting and reforesting and doing all of that. It can be very beneficial. Um, so Julie asked a good question. Are there certain soil characteristics or types where root rot, root rot is more common? Um, for example, in a gravelly or prairie type soil. Uh, I, I I don't know the answer to that question. I uh, I, I think a little bit differently, and I, I may be thinking wrong. But uh, when I think of these pathogens, I often think of uh, from the perspective of the host. And if these gravelly soils are droughty, then the competitive advantage is towards the pathogen. Uh, if these clay soils are heavy and often saturated, once again, the competitive advantage favors the pathogen. So that's sort of how I think when I think about soil types. Uh, is it advantageous to the host? And if it's advantageous to the host, then the probability of finding these uh, diseases is, is uh, a bit less. That makes sense. We have a request from Stephen for you to send the uh, link for the survey and treatment options for laminated root rot. I must have missed that link, but if there's one in your PowerPoint that you're aware of, uh, maybe we can send it out in the email tomorrow. I did attach one URL. If I don't know if that's the one that they were referring to or not. So let okay. us know if it was, if it's not the right one. Okay, yeah. Stephen, let us know if you, um, if we address that. So another question here, um, what time is it? It's 12.50, so we can keep going right up to one and see what we can cover. Um, what are the legal and ethical consider considerations of ignoring a widespread laminated root, pro root rot problem, which could potentially uh, increase you know, wildfire risk or bark beetle infestation uh, in area adjacent areas, basically. Have you had any, any thoughts on that? Well, uh, I think uh, Rachel alluded to this earlier. These are these pathogens are common inhabitants of, their, of our forest. Uh, they play very significant roles. Uh, they increase the complexity of forests. They provide habitat. Um, it's only when we impose our values of fiber um, and recreation that they become problematic. So, you know, yeah. the legal issue would be certainly with hazard trees. Um, and we've, we've uh, come head to head with that uh, at state parks. Um, we've been sued a couple of times. The last one I gave a deposition for was at, at Kopachuk State Park, where uh, here's a park that was infested with laminated root rot in the campground. I offered them the option of either closing the campground or cutting the trees. The recommendation was make to cut the trees down. Uh, four years after we cut the trees down, the properties beneath the park slid into the Puget Sound and State Park was sued because uh, it was believed that the effect of our harvest impacted the instability of the slopes. And so that was that was really problematic. Our intent was simply to protect the public and keep them safe. Um, and so that that became a legal issue uh, rather yeah. quickly. Yeah, yeah, that could be a tough one. But otherwise, you know, outside, I like what you said there, outside of the objectives of recreation and and timber, um, yeah, these are native, these are native pests and diseases that are part of the natural ecology of, of forests. Um, so you don't necessarily need to get after your neighbor for not treating a, a, a root rot pocket. Um, so this is an interesting one is development of genetic enhanced resistance um, in a given species being studied. Are you familiar with any research looking into like resistance in Doug fir to laminated root rot? Yeah, in fact, uh, the co-author of that laminated root rot publication, Rona Sturrock, has spent most of her career looking for families of Douglas fir that demonstrate uh, levels of resistance to uh, laminated root rot. All right, so we may have covered this, but just for good measure, um, the laminated for laminated root rot, how much of a margin would you want to cut out from a pocket? 
So uh, I, I'm not going to give you a fixed distance, but what I'm going to tell you is that you should probably cut the trees until the point that you no longer see staining in that cut stump. Okay, and that's an indication that you've you you may have in fact cut a perfectly healthy live tree, but that's the insurance that you need to make sure that the fungus is not on that root system. Okay. And that's that's what you're trying to do because remember that that uh, the the pathogen on that root isn't going anywhere. The idea is that the the the, the next tree beyond the one that you cut, uh, you don't want it roots to come and explore that uh, now unoccupied space, right? And depending on the soil types, you have deeper soils. Um, uh, the root systems tend uh, not to be so flared on deeper soils. So it's also mm -hmm. a function of your soil type. Shallow soils, shallow soils, uh, short distances to bedrock, uh, your root systems tend to be much wider and much more broadly distributed than in deeper soils. Yeah, and he had a follow-up question too of what if excavating stumps, but I don't think that your advice really changes in that regard. Um, so a question from Quest uh, College Community Programs. Uh, are different root rot species known to be important forage for wildlife, such as insects, tree, squir tree squirrels, or other species that would excavate, dig, and search out for these fungi as food? So are, is anything feeding on the fungus itself, or is it just sort of indirect benefits to wildlife? I am unaware of any... Uh, certainly any mammals that feed on uh, even the fruiting structures or conchs, yeah. uh, I, I'm unaware of any. There might be some micro fauna that feed on them, but I, I'm unaware of any. Yeah, and that's, that's what looks like what Rachel said as well. And uh, I know we had Ken Bevis on earlier, and maybe he's typing up a response to this, our, our wildlife biologist from the DNR, but I'm sure he would say that, um, to reiterate what Rachel said, that the, the dead trees themselves cause, uh, provide a lot of habitat. So maybe not directly providing food, but providing a lot of really key habitat. Uh, yeah, certainly the woody conchs of uh, heterobasidian, I, I don't imagine too much eats them. Possibly these fleshy mushrooms of armillaria, they might be yeah. edible. Um, but besides those two, I don't think uh, Folinus or Caniferporia would be one that would taste very good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that is the bottom of the chat. And I think we're um okay, we got we got one more here and two minutes left. Do you mind hanging on for another quick question, Dan? Sure. All right. Uh, it says this has been touched on, but it sounds like the best way to resolve root rots is to starve the fungus, i.e., planting non-susceptible trees. But if uh, she says dumping, but I think she's referring to, to, to stumping, seems to be working in Canada. Are there any plans to evaluate its actual benefit here? Uh, certainly not on state lands. Mm. Uh, I don't know. So it's generally limited to those most productive sites, um, highly valued species. So Douglas fir and highly productive sites. That seems to be the case uh, where the BC Ministry of Foresters, Forestry are, are using stumping to control both Felinus and Armillaria, Felinus coniferporia and Armillaria. So there are certain conditions, um, but I, I'm unaware of any industry folks here in the lower 48 that are using stumping to any significant degree. Maybe, maybe somebody else might have some information on that. Okay. Well, thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Um, and we will call it there. It's almost one o'clock. Appreciate everybody for coming. I really appreciate you, Dan, for Thank presenting you. on this. Um, I will be getting this recording up later this afternoon. And we have one more session tomorrow on lesser known root diseases uh, with uh, Rachel back to speak. And Dan, I don't know if you'll be joining along for that one, too. Um, but uh, either way, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow.